Good morning. I'm John Boylan, and I coordinate the Studio 99 uh, Artist Lectures. Uh, today we have Tamika Thiel, who is an uh, uh, artist and with, a, with an interesting technology background who works on augmented reality as well as other art and technology interface projects. And that's what she'll be talking about today. Uh, so I think that's about it for me. And uh, thank you, Tamika. Uh, Good to have you here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, is the mic on? I guess it's only important for the recording. Yeah, I believe I mean, it should be on. Yeah, let's presume it's on. Yeah, so um, thanks for the invitation. And um, because you are a computer company, actually, could we douse the lights a little bit? Um, we've got a lot, of, uh, at least the ones that are on the screen here. We're getting a real washout. I've got a lot of black things to show. Right, so I started out as a product designer and uh, worked for Hewlett Packard in Silicon Valley, um, and then got bored of that, went to MIT, um, decided I wanted to become a media artist. But a friend of mine, said, uh, right when I graduated, say, said, I'm, I'm starting this company. Can you come and do the product design for the connection machine? And um, you might have heard of the connection machine. You might have heard of Danny Hillis. Uh, we were all. 20-year-olds. Um, Danny and I are the same age. We're about uh, 25, 26 at that point. And uh, this was a um, massively parallel uh, supercomputer, the first commercial machine uh, designed for artificial intelligence as a supercomputer. And the big boys, uh, IBM and Cray, were all going like, artificial intelligence? No one believes that that stuff will ever work. Are you kidding me? So we were really the, you know, we were the kids who were out there, and you know, the company did go bankrupt um, for various reasons, like the end of the Cold War. But um, but the machine did come out, and um, had 64,000 one-bit processors, uh, 16 to a chip, and it's uh, when I gave this uh, full talk on the machine at MIT, it was. Uh, how the machine got its blinking lights, which uh, is one of the uh, sterling characteristics of the machine. And uh, you see here that they're actually the status lights, which are usually connected with each processor to say the processor chip's getting power. I brought out to the edge of the board, and then the doors are trans, um, translucent, so you can see them. You can see the machine thinking is the idea, like a huge electronic brain. And um, the idea of behind the package design was to show really the structure of the machine. And the most important part of the structure was the 12-dimensional Boolean N-cube network that our, uh, our friend and, and uh, co-worker Richard Feynman proposed as the internal network to connect the processors together. So in this case, in the case of a Boolean N-cube, then you have a, a one-dimensional network connecting two processors. You double that connect the edges to get a 2D uh, network. You double that, connect the edges, you get a 3D. And then the interesting thing is the fourth dimension, where you start running into the fact that we're so limited by only living in, in uh, three dimensions plus time. So the standard representation of a hypercube is, again, you double the cube, um, you nest them inside of each other and then connect the edges. But I had to wire this thing, and I had to be able to wire it up to 12 dimensions. So when you start doing that and nesting them inside of each other, that didn't really tell me much about how I could deal with this topology. So I played around with it and said, well, you know, if, we, if I put them side by side and then connect the edges, then I can represent those fourth level connections with sort of a meta line. And that makes it uh, very easy to deal with conceptually and also to go through this fourth, fifth, sixth, up to the 12th dimensions by saying, OK, this is the structure with the five dimensions, but I can reduce it down here where you can start seeing, again, this repetition of line, square, cube, line, square, cube, so six dimensions. It's kind of pretty here, but it's more comprehensible there. And then you go on up to the 12th dimension. Of course, the reality was um, not quite so clean. <laughs> um, the, uh, the first uh, couple dimensions were on the chip, and then there were other ones on the board. And then the highest level dimensions had to span across the machine. And because we were doing um, massively data parallel, 
uh, processing. Uh, we were not up against the speed of light as Cray was at this time. Cray had the, these rat's nests of wires on his machines um, because the speed of light was a real issue and all the lines had to be short as possible. So, um, so basically, uh, this also became the t-shirt logo. You can buy the t-shirt from my website. And it became uh, very popular in the 90s when Apple used um, a picture of Feynman wearing what became known then as the Feynman CM1 t-shirt uh, in the Think Different ads. So I like to say this is the only supercomputer that's been designed after a t-shirt logo because this cube of cubes is basically exactly what then I, I took for the final shape of this machine. The machine um, has its 30th anniversary this year. The faster successor, the CM2, has its 30th anniversary next year. 2019 is the 30th anniversary of the CM2 winning the Gordon Bell Prize as the fastest supercomputer on Earth. And so over the span of, of uh, three years, I'm doing a project um, to give people, well, at the very basic level, you can print out the logo, uh, the t-shirt logo, lay it down in your living room, and um, uh, through an AR app, we'll be able to see the machine in your living room. But I also want to look at applications that the machine was working on then, and applications that are, being, uh, 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 that are relevant today that came out of the sort of AI research, which is really now, of course, driving the world in a way that um, back 30 years ago, people never expected. So um, I was very, very delighted that a major or the major art and design, a modern art and design museum um, has acquired one from the collection. I can't say more, but um, that uh, will hopefully be um, publicized within the next half year. And uh, I'm hoping to have then, uh, you know, an app or uh, some sort of AR, VR uh, um, experiences that are, are immersive in nature but re, uh, relate you back to the machine and to the sort of content that came out of this development in artificial intelligence. So um, jumping from that, I finally, after the machine was done, uh, I was able to um, go on and, uh, to my dream of becoming a media artist. And I got into um, uh, one form of virtual reality back in the mid-90s when all of, us, all of a sudden the technology was such that interactive 3D virtual worlds, which before had only been running on $100,000 silicon graphics machines, were then uh, able to run on, on simple desktop Windows computers with Pentium processors, Pentium 90. So um, I got hired by this new company, uh, Worlds Incorporated, that had some of this early technology to work with Steven Spielberg, who was then chairman of the Starbright Foundation, to, do, um, uh, to create a 3D online multi-user interactive avatar world for seriously ill children. The Starbright Foundation had this idea that they could use game technology to make to either help inform kids about their illnesses or give them distraction from their illnesses. And we're talking about, you know, kids like this two-year-old uh, cancer patient and um, who grabbed the mouse and was off running through the virtual world. Uh, cystic fibrosis, also, all sorts of very, very severe illnesses. And, you know, compared to the, uh, the current uh, crop of wonderful uh, VR headsets, which give you this immersive stereo experience, but uh, also um, in, induce a lot of, um, of, uh, of nausea. In that environment, we said the kids have so many drugs that cause nausea anyway. They're connected to machines anyway, whether they're on dialysis or whether they're getting some other sort of treatment. So we said, OK, no stereo no headsets, and we don't want the isolating experience, we want the kids to be able to sit together. So the uh, virtual world was running on a, um, on a PC, on a Pentium 90 PC, in the playrooms that got the kids out of their beds, into the playrooms to talk with each other. They'd go online and uh, hope to see E.T. You know, when we asked Stephen, well, what do you want for your avatar? He said, well, E.T., of course. 
It's like, oh, I'm sorry, we asked. Of course, we should have known that. So, so that, again, was an um, encouragement to the kids to get out of their beds, stop moping, and just forget their Ill illness and, and come here in these virtual worlds together to play with each other and maybe with Stephen. And um, one of the worlds at the time, the one up there, Build Your Own Zone, also had building blocks that they could move around. This is about a decade before Second Life brought this sort of technology into people's living rooms. And that was actually a problem with this project. We were really 10 years ahead of our time. So the, um, the, the platform wasn't stable. The uh, internet connections at home were still dial-up modems. I, uh, if you, you know, were, they were just too slow. So basically, it only ran about um, two, three years as a pilot project and then was replaced by a multimedia website. But it, but it was really a pioneering, pioneering work in this sort of online virtual worlds. So I took this technology and said, I want to um, make uh, uh, virtual worlds of my own with my own content. And the first piece I did together with a, a friend, um, Zara Hushmand, who is Iranian American, was this piece, Beyond Mansnar, where we were talking, uh, com sort of comparing the experience that the Japanese Americans went through during World War II when they were interned for the crime of being the face of the enemy, um, for being Japanese American when, when America was at war with Japan, with a similar threat uh, to intern um, Iranians. Oops. OK, uh, here uh, in this slide, to intern Iranian Americans back in the 79, 80 Iranian hostage crisis times when uh, people were calling to intern an entire group uh, on the basis of, of, of their ethnicity, even if they had uh, done no crime whatsoever. This, of course, is a, was a very resonant experience after 9-11. Um, when uh, all of a sudden, you know, Iran, Iran, so Iranian Jews were being uh, investigated for the FBI for uh, being Islamic terrorists. It's like, wait a minute, guys. You know, not all people from the Middle East have the same uh, ideologies and backgrounds. But um, because of the ethnicity, OK, you're all just being put into the same internment camp. That was the fear. And it was able to be averted uh, at some level um, also because of um, protests from the Japanese Americans who had gone through this experience had uh, had uh, been able to find out in the 80s that actually the Justice Department lied about the fact uh, that the uh, Japanese Americans were not a threat whatever to society. The Justice Department said in front of the Supreme Court, every single man, woman, children down to one sixteenth drop of Japanese blood is a threat to American security and should be interned and ignored six different studies from the government, from the military, saying this was absolutely not true. So um, somehow uh, that knowledge was around after 9-1-1 and uh, prevented the government from being able to proceed with that. You lied to us once. Um, are you lying to us again? Always an interesting question. So, uh, so the next piece that I, I did with this technology, again, um, uh, no headsets, no 3D. It's a single projector. It has a very simple joystick with just forward and back because um, that is something that even people who, are, um, who, who don't have full use of their arms can do, people in wheelchairs. Uh, a large projection screen, and uh, it's about um, 12 feet wide, 9 feet high. And the important thing, it goes all the way down to the bottom because if you see a virtual world on the screen like this, it is a window. It is an image. If you see it uh, basically so that the image is life size and there's no barrier for you to walk into that image, your body perceives it as a space. Even if you don't have stereo, even if it's only in one plane and not surrounding you. And this is a way that I can take this technology, these virtual worlds, to any country. I showed it in Colombo in Sri Lanka, and they didn't have a screen that, that was that large, and they didn't have a wall that was that large. So they took three pieces of cloth, sewed them together, and we just ignored the fact that there were seams running through the middle. But um, you know, I could do that in a village in India, and we did talk about that, but although it didn't happen. So other, um, a completely different content here, taking an Occidentalist view, imagining the West, which is actually a, uh, 
uh, genre of Japanese art um, from the 16th century up into the 19th century because the Japanese were prohibited on pain of death from leaving the island or coming back to the island once they had left. So there were a, a whole group of artists during that time, during those 200 years, who fantasized the West and made these Occidentalist fantasies. There was also the uh, religion that was um, the hidden Christians. Christianity was uh, forbidden on pain of death, and they, just like with, uh, uh, with, the, with the Jews under the Inquisition who stayed but converted, you know, they were checked every year to make sure that uh, they would trample a cross or whatever to prove that they were not um, uh, actively practicing. But what they did, um, the ones who wanted to stay Christians, were they took the uh, Kanon, uh, Guanyin, the goddess of mercy, the Asian Buddhist goddess of mercy, who's very much a Maria, Madonna Maria figure, and worshipped her in secret as the Mother Mary. So, um, so here's also a, a, a technique of using a lot of 2 and a half d using images that I put into a particle system. So you have all these angels and uh, bodhisattvas swirling around you. Um, and, and this is one way of bringing then also uh, art history into these virtual worlds, into a 3D interactive space, even if it, it's not fully 3D and stereo. Then the, the last large piece I did in this technology was uh, with the Berlin Wall. And there we had uh, more funding from the um, city of uh, Berlin, city state of Berlin, and were able to hire um, uh, people to help do the research, do the uh, do the um, 3D modeling and actually have uh, 3D characters. And I'm hoping to put a little bit of this um, uh, because it is uh, all, all 3D. Uh, it would work with a stereo headset and I'm hoping to put a little bit of that um, available on online relatively soon. So um, how am I doing on time? I'm a, okay. Um, so, so the next uh, the, the next jump in my in my um, art practice was doing artificial uh, artificial augmented reality instead of uh, sort of a virtual reality. And this happened when a, f a friend of mine said, "Hey, we're going to um, put augmented reality artworks in the Museum of Modern Art." We haven't told them yet. We haven't gotten their permission, but we can do this with the geolocative GPS-based uh, artificial. Uh, augmented reality technology um, send us something. So I sent them um, this piece that I call the art critic face matrix, a bunch of screaming faces saying, this is not art. And uh, I wasn't able to attend, but um, they got together a big group of people who were all then uh, looking in their, in, on their mobiles in MoMA. And um, of course, a little bit later, I was able to go back and, and make some screenshots of, of my own. And the piece is still there. This is from uh, last year where, uh, in, in the atrium where they were setting up a, a new exhibit. Actually, that is the new exhibit it's supposed to, uh, it, it was supposed to look like that. Um, just really quickly, I then uh, led, we formed an artist group, and I led our intervention into the Venice Biennial uh, and um, placed uh, this work of, of my own on censorship in the arts uh, in, in Piazza San Marco. These are our artists. Um, let's see, these, these two artists, for instance, have had artworks that were supposed to be in uh, past biennials that were censored because of, uh, well, you never find out why. So, um, so she was going to put, uh, um, she was going to replace the signs on the Vaporetto stops with the, with the same signs, but in Arabic. And uh, he was going to put a big black cube in the middle of, of Piazza San Marco. So um, presumably, the city was worried about uh, you know, either um, you know, anti-Islamic or, or pro-Islamic violence. But uh, I found out that one pro thing about censorship is that you usually never are told directly why it's b being censored. So that was an interesting. Uh, uh, project also for me to find out about censorship. And this uh, version of uh, the piece, another work in the series, was actually in the enclosed 
uh, Giardini, where all the pavilions are for the Venice Biennial, and had just dismembered heads because these were artists who had been threatened with arrest or physical violence, like Ai Weiwei, who was, had been disappeared at that time um, in April, uh, April uh, so spring 2011. So, um, so this piece uh, got a lot of uh, nice publicity and, and has led to various commissions. I'm going to go a little bit quickly here. Um, uh, this one where we were working with um, uh, scientists uh, uh, using biosensors. So uh, a very robust uh, technology. This is a little bit old at this point, 2013. Robust technology of, of heart rate sensors which um, you can use to uh, trigger a signal that says now plant some wild growth here in Liverpool. And the idea was to s sort of take back the city, overwhelm the city with wild growth vegetation, but not just any vegetation. You had to decide, are you going to be an indigenator, planting native plants, sort of taking back the city, or an exoticator, planting exotic invasives, invasive plants that due to climate change are now moving into the, um, the Isles, uh, the, the British Isles. Here you see the interface. Uh, this person has just um, uh, paired their heart sensor with the, with the app and the, the heart then starts beating. And we use this uh, relax to win strategy. So, uh, so you can't just say, okay, I'll run through the city and cover as much as territory as possible. Um, it, that makes your heart rate get too high, and then you don't plant. You, and if it's too low, if you're just standing there, it doesn't plant either. You have to find a tempo where you can maintain a relaxed state of mind while walking through the city with its ups and downs, its staircases, its trucks rushing by, um, people on the streets. And uh, only when you are in tune with the city and its rhythms does it plant at then 10 second intervals. So, um, so we worked with a, a world museum. They have a botanical collection that was, that was uh, uh, brought in um, in the 1800s actually, starting from then exotic plants from uh, America, Africa, um, South Africa. This is inside the museum. We planted lots of those plants. So the, the plants are coming out of the archives and, and uh, spreading out through the city. And here are native oaks uh, defending the Liverpool docks. And of course, this sort of native versus invasive uh, is used just normally when dealing with plants. And you want to like, help uh, remove the invasive plants from, from the park that are taking over. But of course, there's this subtext here. If you talk about humans with the same terminology, you get right into where we are right now with refugee crises. I live in Germany. We had, on a couple of weekends, we had 50,000 refugees coming into the city. And at that point, you know, the US is going, well, maybe in the next year we can take 10,000 refugees if we really look at them carefully. And we were getting 50,000 uh, refugees coming over the border on just a weekend. You know, we had, Germany took in 1.2 million refugees last year. At that level, 10,000, you're not even on our map. I'm sorry, you're not part of the solution. So um, we, we took the project on to various other cities. The real contrast, of course, was in Dubai in the, in the desert. Uh, so here's uh, some native plants um, uh, uh, populating the desert. And of course, in the desert, you can only live in oases. And uh, Dubai and these rich uh, Arab Gulf states are really about terraforming, um, creating il new islands and creating a new, t uh, new territory out of the desert. And uh, we brought in then, of course, the invasive British plants that used to be a British protectorate. So there's also that aspect here. Are we recolonizing them? But you know what? If you have, if you're, if, if you're, if you're rich, if you're wealthy, if you're in control of your own destiny, um, then, then you, you say, oh, beautiful little exotic plants. It's not a threat as it would have been then, for instance, uh, 100 years ago or something. Um, so uh, the, the, the gentlemen in the textile soup were, were uh, rather delighted to have their photographs taken. Then there was the other aspect, of course, that um, actually we were part of a festival and most of the um, helpers that we had were, were actually women, young women from uh, women's college. And they're uh, my you know, uh, six foot um, five 
um, uh, six and a half foot uh, male partner uh, was saying, I can't tell these girls that they should put this thing on underneath their clothes right up against their bra. It's like, I can't do that, you know. So we ran into other interesting cultural issues when dealing with the body in, uh, in, in that context. Um, another project I, I did, uh, which is um, also uh, um, I'm, I'd like to do a follow on, was um, dealing with the Shard and the neighboring Guy's Tower at King's College London um, to work with a, um, uh, a clinical psychiatrist, Dr. Dominic Fitch, uh, whose work is in palinopsia. These are visual disorders. And uh, one of them, for instance, is poly polyopia, where uh, something in your visual field just be becomes detached from the actual object, replicates across your visual field, and then you know, stays there until it decides to go away. Or um, a really fascinating one, uh, illusory visual spread, where the texture from one object spreads ac across to another object. So we were trying to uh, do AR visualizations of, of these visual disorders, give people an idea of, of what it would be like to have your, um, have, have your world transform in this way out of your control. Now, these things, uh, the version I did then was essentially handmade. Um, I was using um, geolocative uh, AR because it turns out the, um, I was hoping to be able to use environmental mapping, but this, the shard is, is hugely tall. And uh, it, you know, the, the depth sensors just didn't read up to there. So um, I had to sort of fake it with, uh, with uh, geolocative AR, and of course the thing wanders around. So this is a project where it'd be really nice if I could work with um, uh, computer vision people to see if it would be possible to do a version that really does take something out of your environment and then replicates it or takes the texture out of your environment, which might be a little bit harder, and then spreads it around. But um, in this project, uh, um, we've, one, one thing we found out as I was building this experience, I was talking with uh, Dr. Fitch and, and saying, well, what happens? Does it come suddenly? Does it fade in? Does it leave suddenly? Does it fade out? Is it, uh, is it around you or only in front of you? And he said, I don't know. No one's ever looked at that. It was very interesting. We found out that all of the questions that had been asked were always very static. There was no questioning about the dynamic process of how, uh, of how these episodes came and left and, and you know, when you walk around, uh, what happens to you. So, um, so he was really amazed and said, you know, we've never even thought of asking these questions. There's a whole new line of research here that could be done that only came out of our discussion of this. And there was a very interesting... Uh, interview at the opening party. I didn't talk to the guy, and then I get the, the video recording afterwards, and there's this scientist saying, most artists are parasites sucking knowledge out of scientists for their own purposes, and this is a rare project where both sides are profiting. And I thought, it's a, great, it's a great quote. I wish I had talked to the guy. And I understand, you know, I understand his, his feeling, um, because I do come from a, a technical uh, background. but. Um, but it was a little bit harsh wording, perhaps. So um, let's see. OK, I think we're doing OK. So now a couple of local projects. This was uh, one done last year with my mother, who called me right when the talk was supposed to start. She's a Japanese arts expert um, and a master calligrapher. So um, we got an invitation at the Wing Luke Museum in Seattle to um, do an uh, installation in, in a room and pretty small room. And then mom, who has been doing this calligraphy on, on paper for decades and winning prizes for it here in Japan, all of a sudden said, you know, I'd like to, um, I'd like to try doing it on mylar and, and spread, uh, spread it across several sheets. And the whole idea of doing this, uh, this, this piece was to uh, try and bring calligraphy as an abstract gestural art closer to a Western audience. Because a lot of, a lot of times, um, Japanese or Chinese can't read the characters either because they're so abstracted or it's an old form of the character. So they appreciate it as visual art and of course, you know, anyone in the world should be able to appreciate that too. So she had multiple sheets, um, was separating the characters in ways that you do not do ordinarily. 
so that when you look from the side, the character does not fall together, it does not read. When you look straight at the front, it, it does. But these multiple sheets and then a breeze that from the ventilation and the cast shadows meant that there were these several layers of, 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 of the strokes over and not, uh, not, not only on top of each other, but also moving with respect to each other constantly. And then uh, we had an iPad with my augmented layer uh, on top of that. So if you, you can swivel it around and if you look through, then you see, for instance, other people then um, basically enveloped with the, um, with the augmented layer in the front and various layers of the calligraphy and of the shadows in back to create sort of a total installation, a total surround installation. Beyond that, beyond the gallery installation, we also did this as a public art installation with uh, geolocative AR again, and it, um, came up with a rather long list of 18 locations around the city that were important to us as part of our family history. Um, we have been in the Puget Sound area for four generations. I'm half German, half Japanese, so you know there's an additional component uh, there. But um, but we were looking for sites that were important to us as a family and as Japanese Americans. So I came up with rather surprising things like the Seattle Center. I mean, part part of it is that my mother is an organizer at the Cherry Blossom Festival. This is the Cherry Blossom logo and the pavilion where they hold the Cherry Blossom Festival is right there. But um, I also found out in the course of the research that uh, the, um, the person responsible for the wasp waste design, Vic Steinbrook, um, uh, was also the reason our family was in Seattle. He was a friend of my father's and um, invited him to come and teach at the UW, and that's the reason why we settled there. And then the International Fountain, Mom said, oh yeah, you know, when we were living in Japan right before coming to Seattle, a couple of graduate students came by and, and they had just, uh, they were submitting a design for this fountain uh, and they were asking our advice on it. So, so this is something that I had never ever heard of. I was five years old at that time in Japan. Um, so I found out that this, you know, this, uh, this site really has a lot of connections. They put up the character for Odoroku for surprise because when we came to the city, the whole Seattle Center was being built up. It was called Century 21. You know, they were imagining the, um, the, uh, the, the 20th first century, even though that was 1961. Another site that I discovered um, was a site of family Japanese American history, the Pike Place Market. I hadn't realized until I um, was doing this research that until the internment in World War II, two-thirds of the stands were run by Japanese Americans. And my grandfather and great-grandfather, who were farming down in Fife, at, uh, kind of in the South, uh, uh, South Sound, um, also said, uh, sold their uh, vegetables there. Um, this was way before the war. But um, that, of course, completely ceased to exist. Uh, the Japanese Americans were given three days to pack everything, get rid of everything, and then were put in internment camps. And that almost meant the death of the uh, Pike Place Market. So, so that incident in, in 41 really was the beginning of the decline of the Pike Place Market as the actual farmer's market. And then this is just a uh, shot in Gum Alley around the corner that, that I really like. Mukashi Mukashi um, talks about long, long ago it's the standard uh, way that fairy tales start out. So thinking back on, on my great grandparents and, and my grandfather's generation. And then, um, and then John uh, very kindly um, invited um, us to do a reprise of, of the piece. We'll be showing it in the, um, the King Street station. We'll be showing the Mylars and then people will be able to go out into the surrounding neighborhoods and look at things like this Naigai inside, outside Chinese gate. Who's the insider? Who's the outsider here? Especially as Japanese Americans in the Chinese American district. So, um, so that'll be happening in um, in October inside uh, in, inside this uh, beautiful old, old historic building. I'm not sure if I'll be able to come, but um, but it sounds like it's going to be a fascinating festival. And then. Um, 
I'll just go through really quickly. You're the first ones getting, uh, getting a sh show of these images. Um, this is what I'm here in, in, in town to do. Uh, AR installation, again, on global warming for the Olympic um, uh, Sculpture Park. So I've mutated native plants. So these farewell to spring have developed little antennas. And if you look at them, now they're not feeding just off the visual spectrum of, of light, but off the electromagnetic uh, radiation smog from your devices. They'll expand towards you, try and engulf you. You might notice there's uh, some stuff floating in, in the sky. Those are the bullwhip kelp that um, I'd always wondered what those strange things were on the beach as a kid. And then I found out um, that uh, these beautiful, fan fantastically beautiful bullwhip kelp will actually do reasonably well with the warming waters. And so here, uh, they've become mobile uh, drones so that they can come on land if the waters get to be uh, uh, too soupy. And they're feeding off uh, detritus, not only in the water, but uh, detritus that they find in, on the land. The, the, here are the signs from the uh, Elliott Avenue. And, um, and then uh, a bit closer to the water, uh, this is great. They were doing some sort of work on the sculpture, and there's this strange creature here. But, all, but then also my bullwhip drones. And then these things, which are uh, Alexandrium catanella, um, uh, which cause the red tide. And the red tide is a poisonous, toxic algae, which um, will do really well in the warming waters, thank you. And so um, there are blooms in the spring where the water turns red, I guess more towards the coast, but um, it, is, it does come into the sound and is projected to expand as the waters get, um, get warmer. So these are microscopic things, but they've got these spherical shapes. They look really scary. And then in, uh, in my um, installation, then, then uh, they spit out these spores that sort of spread out and swarm around. So I invite you to come. Um, actually, on, at, on the 25th at 4 PM, I'll be uh, holding a, a tour there. But it's open uh, throughout uh, the summer until September 30th. And there, there are um, going to be kiosks with posters with uh, information on how you, how you see them. And there's also uh, open uh, guided tours on Sundays, 12 and, and 1 PM. Um, an interesting little point of the um, linked website to this, I was doing research uh, talking with uh, various UW climate scientists and came across interesting things. And one, one study that I link talks about how essentially by 2050, um, at this point, we pretty much will have a uh, five degree temperature rise. That puts us in a range of temperatures that have never existed in the course of human civilization. Human civilization goes back maybe somewhere here. Humans, Homo sapiens, goes back here. Um, I think six million is considered the beginning of the hominoids. We're going into territory that we've never encountered as the human race. So one final thing. Very different um, an installation where I re uh, read in your face. I work together with a composer who, who um, does a lot of impro improvisational com compositions uh, using data collected from various ways. Here we had a little, a little camera that, that recognizes your face, projects at large there on the, on the screen, and transforms your face, scans your face, and transforms it into your own personal composition. So instead of doing, you know, where's, how big is your mouth? What's the distance between your nose and your mouth? And that sort of biometric things, I was taking actually chiaroscuro black and white data and feeding that onto my uh, composer friend. And he was transforming them that into, into music. And the whole thing is being played out on a metallophone. So the projection surface and the musical instrument is this metallophone, like a xylophone, but sheets of metal, each one tuned to a certain frequency of the 12-tone scale um, with uh, transducers that are, that are taped onto the back. So this is at one and the same time um, the, the projection and the source of the music itself. Um, I think 
that's the end, yeah. I do have some videos if people want to see a little bit more things, but that's sort of the sweep of the work for the last three years. Thank you. Question. Here's a uh, question. I have, I have one. I'm sorry that I, I came late a little bit. So can you explain what is the difference between augmented reality and virtual reality? Yeah. Um, basically, uh, the term virtual reality is being stretched in many, many ways. So um, at, as it's, at its core, though, virtual reality means that you are, you are in a completely synthetic virtual world. Um, uh, it's, it's in stereo. So, so I mean, the, 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 the fantasy is, is that uh, you can't tell the difference between the real and the virtual world. But the virtual world is hopefully a lot more interesting. It's not, it's, it doesn't look like this. You know, it looks more interesting. So, um, so, so stereo. And, and right now, the form we're getting, I just tried out the HTC Vive, which has uh, very good graphics. But um, uh, you, you are totally in a, in a completely different world. You can walk around it. Hopefully, you can interact with it in some ways. They have controllers that you have in each of your hand with a little bit of buzz feedback if you touch another object or something. Um, the problem with that is that, um, is that uh, um, you most people get seasick very quickly. That's, and that's the reason why I was going to these monoscopic projections, large screen projections, without, uh, uh, you know, without, the, without the stereo, without the, the headset. Because there you can, my, the three pieces that I, sh that I showed are very much about movement through space. You can walk along the Berlin Wall. You can you know, walk through a fantastical Venice. Uh, you can walk within the internment camp and, and, uh, and discover that you can't get out. And that sort of movement through space is unfortunately um, very difficult with, the, with, the, with, with these stereo headsets because they produce, um, uh, unless you're actually physically able to walk, which means that you know, you're constrained to a room-sized area or there's various tricks where you can think that you're walking in a straight line, but you're actually turning around. So augmented reality, which is, for instance, what the Microsoft group is doing with the HoloLens, is saying you're seeing the environment, but, um, but you're placing virtual objects on top of it that you see um, in, in, in the most common case right now in your mobile device over the live camera, or with the HoloLens, it's being projected, projected onto the lenses that you have in front of your face. Have I left out anything? Yeah. So um, I'm curious, you, in your presentation, you basically mostly are showing static images of the experiences. But the experiences themselves, I presume, are very dynamic in the sense that you yeah. can move the phone and things like that. So when you, when you go and think about designing something like that, how, what's your thought process on, um, on the fact that people are not necessarily uh, you can't direct people's attention necessarily. You can't prevent them from going different places. So how do you uh, how do you think about design in a space where there's individual freedom to kind of go around right. and maybe miss parts of your artwork or, or, or visualizations or other things that you add? Right. Um, here's a, because that element of uh, movement is actually very important. Here's just a brief clip of of the Odoroku and cherry blossoms. Um, doing a festival, and then, um, and then uh, I'll let this run in the background. Um, here's the Beyond Manzanar piece. Manzanar. Yeah, and that's, that's a really big issue that um, uh, people are struggling with now. And, and the point is, you have to be willing to give up control. And um, the classic, when I was starting to work on, on things, and this is back in the mid-'90s, when I was starting to work on designing virtual worlds, I was looking for information on how I could create a, uh, a dramatic experience for my user without having, without having that control. And actually, the friend I worked together with on this piece is a theater director. And she said, I want a beginning, I want a middle with a climax, and I want an end. And I'm going like, well, this is an installation. People can walk in and out at any given time. So I can't, you know, we can't do that, or I don't want to do that. She was saying, can't you make it so, you know, it restarts every time someone steps on a plate or something. It's like, yeah, but it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't fit. So, so 
I found, I found information, uh, all the information is basically focused on people. You know, you have to find, you have to have a character who's really interesting, and then you have to have a character who's really nasty, and they have conflict, and so, so everything is about con creating drama between people. And I was wanting to create drama between the viewer and the environment. And it turns out, my father um, spent his life working on this, basically looking at it from an architectural urban planning viewpoint about dramatic experiences in sequential spaces. And so I was taking that information and saying, well, it's about having variety in the spaces. Uh, you, can't, uh, you can't force someone to walk through a building or a park at a certain rate, but you, you, can, you can draw their attention by, uh, by putting interesting things. Or um, what we did in this piece is basically there's always only one way out to another scene. There's a, there's, it's usually a door or some sort of space you have to enter. And, um, and you make it sort of compulsory. That's, you know, that's the only way out. So the, this space is actually, this piece is actually, uh, if you will, a necklace of experiences. And it does have sort of a high point um, uh, when you're in the middle of a, of a war. And it has a low resting point, uh, which, will, which is when you're sort of alone with the desert. But, um, but uh, you have to be able to, willing to, let people walk around and use the people as the trigger. So lots of proximity senses here. When you enter a space, that triggers something. If you're doing something with characters, when you walk up to the character, that's when something happens. Um, and then think of it not in terms of one single arc, but say it's, it's episodic. And, and when they talk about classical, um, classical drama, uh, theater, narrative structure, they talk about um, uh, they they talk about the di difference between uh, I'm blanking, but let's just say a dramatic structure or an episodic structure. And an episodic is something like the 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 Iliad, where you have lots of different adventures. Um, you might think of it as you know a, a series of TV shows is has an episodic um, structure. There's sort of this overall arc of what's happening. Uh, uh, to the to the people, but each episode has its own small dramatic points. So so it's a collection of of all the of, of these different strategies where you're saying, okay, there will not be one grand story, but um, but I will provide each uh, I will provide various encounters that are um, that have elements of surprise. I found this great book. Um, uh, um, emotion and Meaning in Music, written in the 50s by a musicologist, where he talks about um, the way you, you create emotion is by creating expectations. I think this is going to happen. And then you surprise those expectations, or you put a twist on it, or you fulfill the expectations, and then you surprise them. So you play around with the, uh, with, with, the, with the users, with the viewers' expectations to create these, these surprise moments, positive and negative. And if you only do negative, the person's going to walk out. If you only do positive, they're going to get bored. So, you ha so it has to be a variation on positive and negative spaces. Um, it has to be a, um, a, a complete world. Uh, which is why it took five years uh, for, for each of these, because it was just a lot of uh, work to create an experience that would um, allow for a variety of, of experiences in, in no matter what direction you go. For instance, here, if you, you know, if you go to one of these islands and say, OK, I'll just try jumping off, then you drown, and then you're reborn. And there's a lot of places where you can die here. There's a couple of hells and stuff like that. So, so each time you, you die, you're reborn. But the world changes every time you wake up again. So, so you have to be willing to create a different sort of experience. And I've, I've, taught, I've taught classes on this. I've got various papers talking about these. I'd be really happy to send you a link if you're interested. But it's all, you know, it's, it, it's all strategies that, that um, that I've developed over the last 20 years or so working with this. And then the challenge with the VR glasses is the fact that, um, 
that the movement is, um, you know, movement is, is, is problematic. And I tried with a, with a Vive. Um, I was over at Valve just last week, and, 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 um, and basically you could walk a little bit, but then for a little bit further, they would have you teleport. That's a disconnect. All of a sudden, you're not sure where you are exactly, even if you chose the position yourself, because it looks different. It'd be a lot better if you could walk there. And I want to see, OK, if I say, when I, am, when I am moving through space, I cannot turn my head. Does that help, for instance? And you can only turn, uh, turn your head when you're standing still uh, or when you're actually walking around. Um, that's the sort of thing that I need to play with because movement through space is so important for me uh, in, in my past worlds. Or you have to stay in one place and let the experience come to you. Are you working with, um, with VR? Are you building in VR? Yeah. Like the projection based movement, yeah. Uh -huh. VR, VR, okay. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh, it's just always interesting with the, the, this, um, like, like what you talked about, the, this kind of fight between trying to do a narrative, right. trying to make sure that people get different parts and not miss it, versus, uh, versus kind of a bunch of vignettes yeah. of, of experiences. Yeah. And so, but even within a single vignette, I, 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 mean, I, I noticed that most of your worlds, especially in the kind of German camps and things like that, are actually, you play this nice uh, contrast between things that are important and things that are not important. Most of the walls are kind of simple and bare. Yeah. And then, you know, you have images embedded and things like that that, of course, right. have a lot of textures and right. content. So your eyes are naturally drawn to that. You better focus there. But um, yeah. I, I think. I think all of those are pretty challenging to counterbalance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have to you have to be very clear about what your focus is on, uh, what sort of experience um, you're you're trying to convey at the when, end of the day. Do you uh, <clears throat> how do you uh, focus primarily on the artistic aspects of it, or is the educational kind of deeper message? Important. Yeah. So, like, do you, do you try to force a message and make sure that people get the message? Are you okay with them, the message being kind of subtly there and they just yeah. experience these? Um, they I'm, I'm really okay. Um, I mean, I would. I, I think you know if. Uh, I, w I would like to do more of of things in line with Mariko Horo, which is a very visual experience. Um, uh, the. I hate to say educational, but uh, maybe it's you know the educational or the informative aspect um, always creeps in. I, I don't seem to be able to get away from it. So you know, I thought Mariko Horo was going to be purely fantasy, but it turns out that you know the whole Abu Ghraib uh, prison scandal came out during that time, and um, and you might have seen one of the worlds had uh, the guy in the you know the 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 guy who was uh, had a black pointy cap over him and, and was told to stand on a box. And if he stepped down, he would be electrocuted. Uh, and the little girl who was napalmed in Vietnam, they were in one of my hells. Um, so and, and the, um, the whole Ku Klux Klan thing came out as, um, as you know, the Abu Ghraib scandal broke. And, and people, you know, people were, uh, were, were um, uh, talking. Uh, also, there was a lot of racial invective. Um, uh, that was going around, so it always creeps in. But for uh, and and with this piece, um, we we got funding essentially from kind of a historic preservationist uh, part of the city funding structure. It was the the um, part of the city cultural uh, senate that was uh, mem memorializing the Berlin Wall, um, and uh, what we decided to do was that the the uh, virtual world experience should be, it should be about presence, it should be about being there, it should be about being able to walk along the wall, measure it with your body, experience it. You should be looking yourself and, and trying to spot things. And so we have, separate from that, uh, um, about eight posters that summarizes the most important information, uh, also a booklet that you can buy for like around 15 bucks that has that and more has a timeline. And, um, and have that separate. You can choose to read it or not. You can choose to read it before or read it after, and then go back in. 
but, um, but we keep this experience about engaging your visual senses and your kinesthetic senses that really are invoked with, with this sort of projection, even if it's not uh, completely immersive. And we, got, we, got, uh, we get grief from both sides, specifically with this project. There was one, you know, one review said, well, the pedagogy was too heavy. And then other ones have said, they didn't even put any signs on the watchtowers telling what year it was built and out of what material. You know, so we basically, uh, for this piece especially, get criticized from both sides. One side says we didn't do enough. The other one says we did too much. And you know, that's, that's also a decision that you have to make. But I, don't, I, I want to have the artistic freedom, um, for instance, with the with the um, piece I'm doing right now in the sculpture park, Gardens of the Anthropocene, um, this, the background is really important to me. I mean, that realization that you know, we've, we're now hitting temperatures that human civilization has never encountered, that came out of one of the studies that I, I read for this. But, um, but I wanted to pr provide an emotional experience when you're at the park. And that's why I decided to go to these mutated plants that we're doing all sorts of weird things and kind of, kind of uh, attacking you, um, when when you uh, when you go to to look at them. So it it has to be your decision, and then the question is, how do you provide that that other information? And for for me, it's it's usually keeping it fairly separate. I'd love to see more, talk more with you, and see what you guys are doing. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, are you planning on doing anything with the Hololens? With the Hololens? Yeah. Um, uh, if the yeah, I mean, first off, I have to get my hands on one. They're kind of expensive um, for for an artist with no income. Um, I would I would love to. the The field of view is 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 of course a problem. Do you know Do you know if it's possible for them to at least make the field of view wi wider vertically? Because because I think that I think I think again that the uh, that the vertical sweep is more important. You're used to going like this, but you're not used to going like this. <clears throat> no, it's why well, it's fixed um, for that particular version of the algorithm. But I suppose it's very well to improve it in the future. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to. I, I took it out. Uh, a friend was able to borrow one over the weekend, and we took it. And I said, "Well, does it work in the garden? Because you have a small enclosed garden." It had trouble with the bushes, but and and it was also too light out out, out there. But um, I, you know, I would love to. I would love to work with that and really try and push it. And and I have a lot of experience working with um, low polygon count, <laughs> and and creating experiences that that are rich despite the fact that you have a lot of technological restrictions. So, you know, so are you are are you part of the are you part of the group? I'd l I'd love to talk to the the Hololens group also. You're going to stay for lunch. Yeah. Uh, so if you want to join us for lunch, we can uh, yeah, we can, can do that. Uh, yeah, that would be great. So no one else. Well, thank you, Domingo. That was amazing. It was well, so thank good. you for all the time and wonderful discussion.